Honoring the Sabbath and keeping it holy in our culture today does not necessarily mean that you don't do any youth sports on Sunday, that you don't cook on Sunday, that you don't... It's it's never been about the legalism that we can assign to it. The true heart of the Sabbath, of God's vision of creation, is that we would find rhythms, patterns, and practices that fill us with wonder, with awe, with beauty, so that we can also be an overflowing, an overflow of God's goodness into the lives of other people. Well, good morning. Here we are, June 2nd. Can you believe it? It's hard to believe for me that we're already in the month of June. Yesterday was our oldest uh, child's 11th birthday, 11 years old, June 1st. It's hard to believe that we've already hit this season where June rolls around. Uh, May is an extremely busy month for many people, and if you're raising children, you know how frantic May can feel. There are so many endings to the school year and sporting teams and all of the uh, goodbyes, the graduation parties. We're still sort of in this extended season of wrapping up the, the past season. My niece, Alyssa, graduated from Marymount High School this year, and her graduation party is later this afternoon. You may have been to a series of these celebrations during this time. It sort of feels like the closing of one chapter and the beginning of a new chapter is emerging. Technically, summer doesn't begin until June 22nd. At least that's what my calendar says. I don't think that's functionally true, though, right? Functionally, it feels like summer begins with Memorial Day weekend, and then we usher into the month of June, and well, here we are on the brink of these three beautiful grand months, June, July, and August. We're headed into a new season as Pastor Alex and the Hoops family head out on sabbatical. As I said earlier, this is Alex's last day with us for 12 weeks. Folks, I just, I, I want to give a fair warning to all of you. Sabbatical is going to be extremely uh, restful for Alex, I believe. Can you imagine what a fully rested Alex Hoops is like? (laughs) I mean, this guy has more energy in his pinky finger than I do in my whole body. I don't know how we're going to prepare for this, but I'm trusting that come come late August, Alex is coming back with even more energy than he already has. In in all sincerity, though, Alex, um, I'm going to miss you. I'm going to miss working with you. But we are so grateful that you have this opportunity. Here we are, Good Shepherd, embarking into a new season. For most of the weeks throughout the summer, as we follow what is called the Revised Common Lectionary, that's a bunch of church speak, for the texts that we follow every week when we gather, For most of the weeks of the summer, the Revised Common Lectionary has us in the Gospel of Mark. And we're working chronologically through Mark's Gospel. We we begin today with the reading from Mark chapter 2 into chapter 3. Next week, we'll continue in chapter 3 and then 4 and then 5. And for many weeks, we are just going to be traveling through the Gospel of Mark. And so... It's an invitation for all of us to buckle up because Mark's gospel is fast-paced. Mark's gospel has a sense of urgency. There's a clarity in Mark's gospel that I think sometimes gets a little diluted in the other gospels. We know Mark's gospel was the first gospel to be written, even though it appears second after Matthew in our New Testament. Mark's gospel was written sometime between 65 and 70 AD. It's the shortest of the four gospels, 16 chapters that is actually designed to be read in one sitting. And I encourage you this summer at some point, carve out 45 minutes, that's as long as it takes, to read the entirety of Mark's gospel from chapter 1 all the way through chapter 16. Now, of course, we'll be going through it 
over the period of around 11 weeks in worship. And as we do, we are going to see with an extreme clarity what is most important to Jesus. What is most important to Jesus? Better yet, if you were going to create a greatest hits album from the life and ministry of Jesus, what would be on it? What would you include? Maybe we would even have an A side and a B side like the old records, right? You're saying old records. Yeah, to me, they're old people. What would be on the greatest hits album of the life and ministry of Jesus? Certainly, you would make the argument that you'd have to begin track one with the birth story. I mean, the birth of Jesus was unlike any other birth. Angels and an immaculate conception, Mary visiting her cousin Elizabeth, the whole nine yards, the stable and the animals and the star. You might even include some of Jesus' greatest teachings on this album. The Beatitudes. How could you leave out the Beatitudes? Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who suffer. Maybe you'd include some of his parables, like the Good Samaritan or the Golden Rule. When Jesus actually tells us what matters most is to love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Those would have to be included. Or some of the healing miracle stories that we know come from his ministry, like turning water to wine. That would be a favorite track. The raising of Lazarus from the dead. Or what about some of his interactions with people that are just fascinating, that have inspired art and creative thinking over the years, like Zacchaeus, the wee little man, the wee little man, was he up in the little tree? Would Zacchaeus make the list? Or what about the two sisters? You could have a track for each of them, one for Mary and one for Martha. All of these stories, I think you could make an argument, would make the list. The fact of the matter is, though, none of them, not one of them, is found in the Gospel of Mark. Did you know that? Mark's Gospel has no birth story of Jesus. There are no Beatitudes. There's no story of Mary and Martha. Thomas, doubting Thomas, is nowhere to be found. There's no water into wine. Lazarus is still dead in Mark's Gospel. (laughs) He's not even mentioned. Mark's gospel is unique. Most scholars believe that the author of Matthew and maybe even Luke used the manuscript of Mark in order to inform and write their own. It was already in circulation. Mark's gospel has this beautiful brevity. And right from the very beginning, Jesus gets to work. If you opened up your Bible like I'm opening up mine to the first two pages of Mark's gospel, just think of the headings. It starts with John the Baptist preparing the way. This is all in chapter one, one chapter. Jesus is baptized by John. The spirit drives him into the wilderness to be tempted. He begins his ministry. He calls the disciples And then he immediately heals a man with an unclean spirit. After the first healing, we're told that he heals many. He entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever. He heals her. And then by the next morning, droves of people are at his doorstep. And he just starts healing, blessing, loving, serving. Then... He goes to Galilee and he preaches his first sermon. Then he cleanses a leper, all in chapter one. By the time we enter into chapter two, it begins again with another healing. He heals a paralytic. Then he calls Levi to come and follow him. And then he starts to get questions. First about fasting. Hey, Jesus, why do your disciples not fast like John's disciples? Jesus engages in a little bit of dialogue. And then we enter 
into the scene we had from our reading this morning. And Jesus starts to get questioned even more so about the Sabbath. His disciples are sort of acting like rebel rousers to the religious authorities. They're plucking grains on the Sabbath. And then he enters into the synagogue and we're told that people were watching him closely. Now, up to this point in Mark's gospel, other people had been watching Jesus, right? We're told so much. They're waiting outside of the house he's staying in. They're watching for Jesus to receive healing. The droves of people already in Mark's gospel who were watching Jesus were doing so with great hope, with with a great yearning to receive a blessing, to be a part of this miraculous ministry that was unfolding. But all of a sudden, this different group of people are watching Jesus not with hope-filled eyes, but with eyes of anger. (laughs) Can you guess who they are? The religious people. Those in control, those with power, those with authority. Already after one chapter in Mark, we have to believe that the reputation of Jesus had begun to spread. Because what we see here is a threefold pattern of ministry in the first chapter of Mark. After the baptism, after the brief mention of him being tempted in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus begins to do three things. Primarily, in Mark, Jesus begins to heal, to bless, to make whole things that are broken. Secondly, Jesus begins to preach and to teach And thirdly, Jesus invites and calls people to be a part of the healing and the preaching and the ministry. Over and again, we'll see it throughout 16 chapters of Mark, this is the threefold pattern of his ministry. Jesus heals, he teaches, he calls and invites. He heals and he teaches, he preaches, he calls and invites. And all throughout that threefold pattern, we see this growing bitterness and resentment among those who have power and authority, whether it's religious power and authority or it's societal power and authority, this growing fear and skepticism unfolds. But maybe it was lost on you when I read it. It's only in the second chapter, the beginning of the third chapter, that those in authority begin to plan to kill him. It's that quick in Mark's gospel. And you have to ask the question, why were they so angered at what he was doing? Because to us, I think to most people today, we look at what Jesus was doing in Mark chapter 2 and 3 and we can't really find a fault with it. He's blessing and healing. He's serving. He's giving life to people. Why did they want to kill him from the very beginning of his ministry? We could have a whole sermon about that. We could wonder why. Was it a threat to their power and authority? Was it a fear or jealousy that he was able to do things they weren't able to do? The little window we get in Mark chapter 2 and 3 into this animosity has to do with the fact that according to some, Jesus is disgracing an ordinance of God. The ordinance of Sabbath, of keeping it holy. So often the Pharisees, when we talk about them, they get a bad rap, and sometimes unfairly. What we know from a historical perspective, from a scholarly perspective, is that the Pharisees were a lay reform movement within Judaism that had a beautiful intent to it. The Pharisaical movement was a movement that was trying to encourage the Israelites to take seriously God's word to read the Torah and the prophets, the law and the prophets, to read it with an intensity, to try to follow God's way of life faithfully. The Pharisees were not some group of 
bad leaders necessarily. They were people that were laser focused on trying to observe the law. But I think they confused the forest between the trees or the trees between the forest so often. We're told that as Jesus entered the synagogue, they're watching him closely to see if he will break one of the Sabbath commands to rest from your work. Now, of course, because we've read chapter one, we know what Jesus is bound to do. He's going to heal the person who has the need of healing. Can you believe it? I knew he would do it. I can't believe he would do this. Today of all days, this is a holy day. This is a day of rest. Can you hear the murmurings and the gossip in the synagogue that day? You see, I think something that had happened is that the Pharisees had become so focused on following the letter of the law that they totally had lost the spirit of what Sabbath rest was intended to do in the first place. We read from Deuteronomy and other scriptures about the need for us to rest, to have Sabbath, to have a a holy time of letting ourselves and the earth lie fallow. All of this is a part of God's intention for creation to enjoy creation, to connect with the creator. But some in the religious community had turned what was meant to be blessing and gift, rooted and grounded in connection, they had turned it into work. What we know is that many in the uh, community They had a certain number of steps that they allowed themselves to walk. If you walked beyond that, then you violated the law of the Sabbath. There were so many rules that were in place to try to keep the Sabbath holy that inadvertently they had turned what was meant to just be gift and blessing into more work. Did I walk too far? Did I do too much? Jesus comes into the midst of it and he ushers in this wave, this wave of reform that was seeking to connect people to what was most relevant. All of his ministry throughout Mark's gospel and the others was both relevant and reforming at the same time. So Jesus comes into the synagogue and he sees what all of the religious people fail to see, which is that there's somebody in their midst for whom Sabbath is impossible. The man who has the infirmity, the man who struggles with a disability, the man whose life and daily existence had to be more difficult than everyone else's. And so you could make the argument through the eyes of Jesus that Jesus actually honors the Sabbath more than anyone else in that synagogue because what Jesus does is he extends, he makes Sabbath rest possible for the man who knows no rest. You see, what Jesus is doing here is he's actually leveling the playing field. He's seeing a person who struggles daily in a society that was often cruel. And he gives that person the ability to breathe again, to relax, to be made whole, to be restored. You see, we all practice Sabbath differently, don't we? Who here has been on a vacation with a family member, a spouse, somebody. Yeah, you all raised your hand. I've been on vacation. Good for you. (laughs) Who's been on vacation with somebody who rests differently than you do? I've actually done marriage counseling with a couple once who came back from a vacation at odds against one another. They, They went on vacation and they thought this would be great. They were a newly married couple, just a couple years married. This was the first major vacation they had taken. They were so excited to 
to, to head out together on the first vacation in their marriage. They came back bitter, angry, and upset with one another. Pastor, can we just talk? Sure, <laughs> what's going on? And when we got to the bottom of it, one of them had always envisioned that vacation rest meant lying on a beach, doing nothing, reading a book the whole time. And the other person, their idea of rest and rejuvenation was hiking every trail possible in their vicinity. Which one is right? They both are. And people rest differently. People are rejuvenated in different methods. Now, Pastor Alex, your sabbatical, I imagine it's going to be filled with what? What are you going to do to rest? What are you going to do? I don't know. He doesn't even know. A lot of, <laughs> lot of family activity. A lot of family activity. He doesn't know how to rest. That's why he's going on one. That's why he's going on one. This season ahead of us is an invitation for us, each of us, not just Pastor Alex and the Hoops family, to prioritize the Sabbath, to rest, to rejuvenate our hearts and our minds toward our Creator. And I urge you to consider what is it in your life that fills you up, that gives you life, that might also give life to somebody else. You see, the times that I can look at back at my life and that I can recall with great clarity were actually rejuvenative, healing, restorative, are those times when I have prioritized rhythms and patterns in my life that fill my tank and that by so doing fill the tanks of other people. Honoring the Sabbath and keeping it holy in our culture today does not necessarily mean that you don't do any youth sports on Sunday, that you don't cook on Sunday, that you don't... Do, it's, not a, it's never been about the legalism that we can assign to it. The true heart of the Sabbath, of God's vision of creation, is that we would find rhythms, patterns, and practices that fill us with wonder with awe, with beauty, so that we can also be an overflowing, an overflow of God's goodness into the lives of other people. Sabbath is never intended just for us. It is a gift for us that is designed to make us whole so that we can bless and serve the world. There are people in our world and in our culture for whom the idea of vacation and Sabbath feels like a fantasy. Just today, as I was driving to work up Kenwood Road from Marymount through Madisonville, up the big road past the Kenwood Senior Center, in the pouring rain, as rain was pouring down, there was somebody with a hooded sweatshirt wrapped tightly walking down that big, steep road road, most likely headed to bus number 11, the bus that's down in the bottom of the hill, to get on a bus, I imagine, to go to work somewhere. As we rest, as we travel, as we read, as we hike, as we marvel at the beauty of creation, my prayer is that we would remain mindful, too, of those who can't find rest, that our ministry and our life together as a gospel community would always have in mind those in our midst who feel as if they're withering because of a culture and a society that is just brutal to them. This season at Good Shepherd, I trust that it will be restorative, it will be healing for you personally and for us communally. But most of all, I trust that as we do this work faithfully, of working and resting, of marveling at creation, that we would have in our mind's eye all that God has created. Every human, every person, every neighborhood in our city. Because until all the world can rest, there will be no true human flourishing. So may your season ahead 
Be filled with goodness. Be filled with hope. Be filled with love so that through you, God may continue to bless the world that God has created. Amen.